Thank you for coming. This is uh, session four of a five session class. And um, I just want to review very quickly what we've done in the first three. Won't take any more than a minute or two, but the first, first one had to do with Jesus in Palestine. It's a story of an itinerant preacher whose charisma and whose message uh, had a great deal of impact at the time. Uh, not only was he talking about God and love and all the other uh, good things we know about our religion, he was talking about a social message, a social justice message, which came out of the Old Testament and which people knew very well. So it was a message that resonated with people as well as his charisma. And he was such an important figure that uh, stories about his resurrection whether you can prove them or not, it doesn't, this, we're not here to question the resurrection so much as to say nobody was there at the time who wrote about it later on. But it was such a powerful message that it carried through the generations. And today we still believe in the resurrection. So here was a person that had such an impact that it's lasted for thousands of years. So that was the first session. The second session had to do with the Jesus movement. And it, it was a, it was Judaism. It was a it was a, a sect within Judaism that believed that yes, Jesus lived, and yes, he was the Christ, and yes, he was the resurrected. That doesn't make it non-Jewish. Uh, it just meant it was a, it was thinking within the Judaist Judaistic uh, uh, community, and that resided for a while. It was a it was a message within Judaism that began to fray and come apart uh, based on what Paul's preaching to the Gentiles. Uh, this message began to resonate with outside the Jewish community. Uh, it also was affected very much by the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, uh, a, a fact of, of, about which was written in the various gospels. This was, this was something that was recognized at the time as being somewhat disruptive of the Jewish tradition. And after that time, Christianity became its own religion. And that was the subject of the third piece, which is to say Christianity as this new religion, still trying to understand what it believed, still trying to understand how it, what the traditions were, how worship should continue, and also how it should exist, both as separate from Judaism on the one hand, and as a part of a rather hostile Roman Empire on the other. And so that story was a part of the third session. This session, we're going to be talking about the Middle Ages. Now, before I get into that, I have an admission to make. And the admission is that I don't believe we're, we're, we'll have the time to spend the time on Christianity in America. Now, let me tell you why. <laughs> First of all, uh, there's a lot of material here. And I didn't want to shortchange the material because in some ways the formation of the church we know today began during the Middle Ages and certainly was refined during the Reformation. And I don't want to miss that. And I think it's important that we understand that through this material. The second has to do with my concerns about just me talking and not having time for questions to occur and so I want to make sure that we give that an appropriate amount of space. So with that, let me ask if there are any questions. Yes. Hi, uh, I mean, how does, I'm, I'm just discovering at this late date the um, mystics, the contemplatives. Yes. People whose names I've not heard ever that I'm discovering like lady Jews. So I don't even know my question. I, I guess I would like to know if the development of what say contem the contemplative aspect of right. the Middle Ages is that it I don't you know, know if it flourished then or started then. I, I'm really glad you brought that up. It's important that we understand what we mean by mysticism. Paul was a mystic. What is a mystic? 
It's somebody that believes they have a personal connection to the spiritual in the form of understanding what, who Jesus was, who he really was, uh, that, that mysticism was found throughout the Old Testament. We find prophets in the Old Testament uh, having mystical experiences, that is, a relationship with God. Same thing with Paul and Jesus. So this is not a otherworldly uh, uh, sit around and think vague, great thoughts. These, these, this is a tradition that exists today and still informs many people's belief and response to Christianity. So don't think of it as this weird hermit-like thing. It, it, it's a real thing and infuses much of what we see as a form of worship. It's legitimate. And so let's recognize that it's not simply this pipe smoking experience. It, it, it's important to recognize that because it's really a part of Christianity. Yes, sir. Uh, I don't think necessarily that the spoken tradition from the time of Jesus to like 40 years after was a weak link because there were people who knew Jesus, the apostles, and people who knew the apostles. And this is how the spoken tradition is best now. Exactly. Uh, the, the Gospels are the written uh, uh, account of an oral transition, an oral, tra an oral tradition, which is to say these stories move from generation to generation without being documented, but in the Gospels, they were. So I'm not saying that the Gospels are illegitimate, far from it, but as oral histories, they bear both the strength and the weaknesses of oral tradition, which is to say, we're not exactly sure what actually happened, but the overall story is true, and, and the overall impact on us remains the same. Whether these are stories carried from generation to generation without documentation, or whether somebody was there to actually report, which they weren't. Okay? How are we doing here? We're ready to charge into the Middle Ages? Okay. <clears throat> um, uh, oops. Uh, so uh, we shared this slide last week, but some of you didn't see it. This is a map of Western Europe, and these are supposedly the barbarian tribes that existed after the fall of Rome. Now, it's important to recognize that uh, this was culturally and politically very different from Rome. It was non-urban. Rome had cities. As a matter of fact, during Rome's heyday, population of Rome was probably in the half a million range, roughly. Rome at the time of the barbarian cultures was a tenth of that, maybe even less. So all of the cities that exist in Rome began to fall apart and crumble. Most of uh, the population lived in the, on the land. It was also a very brutal time. Uh, you've heard of uh, fiefdoms? <coughs> well, that really is just to say some ruler acquired land. He doled that land out to his supporters. But, uh, and, and land was all a part of wealth. That's the way wealth occurred and plunder. So if, if you wanted to, to expand your wealth, you went and robbed the land of somebody else, in addition to whatever value there were, values there were in the land. It was a very hard existence. Um, if you were a peasant, by the way, you were working the land, and the product of your output went to somebody, not you, somebody, it may have been the same person it was last Tuesday. It may have been different. But nonetheless, you were tied to the land and tied to that work. And the wealth you generated was shared with somebody else. Um, it's also worth noting that in, these, in this warfare, it was probable, we don't know for sure, it was probable that land got destroyed. Villages got destroyed in a sense of some military objective. So you never knew from one month to the next whether your land was going to be something that was devastated or not. It was a tough period of time. Um, 
most of the rulers had very brief tenures, which is to say they didn't last beyond their generation. They may have been able to pass it on to their sons or daughters, but it usually didn't last. The, the rulerships that did last had to do with administration, which is to say taxation, generating wealth and money through taxation. In order to do that, they needed literate people. And there weren't that many literate people outside the church. That was one of the enduring uh, uh, advantages of being a church is mostly they were literate. And secular rulers used that literacy in order to maintain their rulership. So that was that's the the that's the the deal at this at this time. Uh, how do I let's see? There we go. And this is a little video on uh, the church organization and how it benefited the uh, secular rulership. The church in this society is represented by bishops and monasteries. We will be talking about monasteries next week. The difference is that bishops rule from cities, even if they are just little shell remnants of Roman cities. Nevertheless, they, they rule from a population center. They are involved with ordinary people, or at least their administrative apparatus deals with regular life. Monasteries are more a retreat from regular life, where monks, as you'll read in the rule of St. Benedict, live in a kind of isolated community, renouncing the world. Now, in actual practice, there would be more similarities and differences, particularly as these monasteries were involved with the world quite a lot. But it is the bishops that represent to the extent that any aspect of society does, a continuation of the Roman order, a continuation of the notion that um, there is a kind of educated ruler of local society. So the bishops are members of prominent families. They're often members of Roman prominent families. Remember that Gregory was Bishop of Tours. The great relic of Tours was the Cape of St. Martin. His family had been bishops of Tours because they were locally prominent under the Roman Empire and continued this prominence under the American Indians. Not necessarily peaceful or easily, as I said, Chilperic had tried to have him deposed. Uh, and you've seen the episode in which uh, they don't get along great. But nevertheless, his family of Sir Cole's senatorial rank, even though there's no Senate anymore, uh, um, so uh, this raises an interesting question about the church and medieval, medieval government. Uh, the yeah, so uh, not only were bishops part of what amounted to the secular ruling experience, they were in cities and they brought order to uh, the population, which was a good thing if you were a ruler. Uh, it, in some extent, it was an extension of what Constantine liked in, in Christianity, not just its beliefs, but the fact that it was a civic structure imposed on a place that was not yet fully his and understood as his. Um, one of the things that it is important to note about Christianity is that its message was a very attractive message if you were a ruler. Why? Well, this idea of salvation, this was a new idea. Pagans did not have an idea of salvation. Christianity did. Why was that good for rulers? Well, they're people too. And they know they don't want to die. And what happens after I die? Well, there's this thing called heaven. There's salvation. And by the way, if the church is able to give me this belief, I should be grateful. And I should maybe reward these bishops and these churches with some presence, usually in the form of land. So not only were bishops invested in Christianity and spread, 
they were invested in the wealth of the, at the time because they had a stake in the outcome. So there's this uh, there's spiritual, religious, secular aspect to the development of, of uh, Christianity. And this was a message that extended not just to the rulers, but to the people below the rulers. It, it was one of the really effective ways that Christianity had of spreading throughout the kingdom, uh, throughout uh, Western Europe. Uh, and the fact that it offered uh, literacy, the fact that it offered stability, that was another great way for people to begin to believe that, yes, Christianity is something that's important and we should believe in it. Uh, as a matter of fact, that over time, uh, the, the unifying theme of Western Europe amidst all of the political turmoil was Christianity. It was known as Christendom, as this big, big, block of territory that was consistent from place to place in their belief in Christianity, in their, uh, in, in their, uh, in their uh, support of literacy. It was a very powerful way for Christianity to spread. Um, I've already mentioned this. This is uh, the idea of Christendom. Uh, early popes were as much political figures as they were religious figures. Uh, in the, in, in, as example here, Gregory I, one of the great popes of the, the uh, Catholic Church, he was a civilian. And it turns out that he helped very much in propelling the Lombard invasions in Rome. And as a result, became bishop. So again, a, a sort of big, big, uh, area between what it meant to be a spiritual figure and a political figure. And that was true throughout the Middle Ages. We would find constantly political reasons for, for church and spiritual decisions to be made as a respect because of this. Uh, by the way, we see some of today's religious figures being political creatures as well. So it's not, it's not an idea of then, it's an idea that we have now, a little differently formulated, but still the case. I'm waiting for questions, so please don't be shy. Um, the bishops were independent of one another. This was the, the, the idea of the papacy and the greater uh, clerical hierarchy didn't exist at the time. Um, bishops were, were anointed, uh, in part because they claimed to be so, in part because it was secular rulers who decided who was going to be a bishop. And the Pope didn't have any different relationship to other bishops. Uh, they were, it was, the, it was the see of Peter, but nonetheless, the area of Rome controlled by the Bishop of Rome was its own thing. It had nothing, it had little to do with naming of bishops in other parts of Christendom, uh, a, a, a fact that became less and less true over time. We'll talk about how that, uh, uh, yeah, I've already mentioned that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, religious practices at the time. Last time we talked about pagan religions and how many pagan practices were, began, were adopted by Christians. Doesn't make it bad, but it, it was a fact. Uh, the idea of uh, Jesus' birthday on Christmas Day was a pagan holiday. The sanctification of Mary came from the Egyptian, Egyptian goddess of Isis, who was known as a motherly figure for those who needed answers, needed help, uh, so the sanctification of Mary came right out of this, uh, this pagan idea of Isis, an Egyptian goddess. Uh, so uh, a, a lot of these beliefs were intertwined with pagan beliefs, pagan uh, practices. Doesn't make it bad. It's just it, it's one of the things that helps us begin understanding a little bit more about Christi what Christianity is today and how it got that way. Um, 
There's no mention in any of the Gospels of Christians. And so the idea of Christians and the idea of Christianity was developed and matured during this medieval period. Important to understand. Um, the whole notion of folk magic was very, very much a part of the life. So um, th think about it. think about what we know today, and how what we know today is so much related to how we get educated, to our understanding of science. There was none of that at this time. If a storm occurred, you didn't know why. There was no explanation for a tornado, no explanation for a hurricane. What else could you have decided but that this was God's will, or this was an evil spirit's will, or whatever? Illness and sickness. Who knows how people got sick? Who knows why people died in huge numbers? Well, it had to be some sign of God or an angry spirit or something. So uh, we shouldn't think of these people as stupid so much as we should think of themselves as being not having the advantages we have in education and an understanding of science. So lots of folk magic, magic uh, practices such as fortune telling, dousing. You, you know what I mean by dousing? That's in order, in order to tell the truth, you, they put you in a chair and they dunk you in some water. And if you came up alive, then you were telling the truth. And if not, you're probably lying in the first place. It's a little, probably a crude example, but it gives you an idea of, of how people view uh, moral failure and error and how they determined who was telling the truth, who was moral and who was not. John, can I share a story? Please. It might be relevant here. It's yes. interesting. I'm your visiting pastor for the day. And I remember as I was uh, studying this period that because, as you say, the, the literacy was predominantly with the church, but you had the need for priests to go out in local communities. And if they weren't always as well educated as the bishop might be. And, and they were giving uh, the mass in Latin. What was the language? And so you would have a priest who was doing their best, maybe not as excellent in Latin as they might, but they would say, this bread, Haipan, is Christ's body, is Christ's body. So Haipan es corpus Jesu. That would be the Latin phrase. And they would come up and say, Haipan es corpus, Haipan es corpus, Haipan because focus, heck, heck focus, 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 focus. Oh, hearing application, and they were saying, I don't know what you said, it was focus, focus to me. Yeah. And this focus, focus. And I'm but, oh, it's, it, it's absolutely true, and and uh, we're going to get into that in a little bit of what people actually saw as a part of of the uh, mass going to church. But one of the things about uh, the Eucharist, Catholics believe that the host is transformed into the Spirit of Jesus. It's a physical thing. To some extent. It came out of this time where we saw spirits here, there, and everywhere. I want to make sure we understand that this was not simply a made-up idea. It came out of the ethos of the time. It's also important to know, to your point, Ellen, that um, if you went to church, uh, Mass was celebrated afar. As a matter of fact, there was something called a rood, which is sort of this, uh, this wooden lattice that separated the altar from the masses. And the Eucharist would be celebrated. People wouldn't know what the Eucharist was. We'd be up there, and the, the, the priest would be waving his arms around and uh, uh, incantations, and they had no idea, in part because, on the one hand, they weren't allowed to be really participatory. On the other hand, the church wanted to, 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 to portray the magic of the Eucharist. It was a spiritual experience 
It was something that was so magical that it was separate from the everyday, burly, burly life of, of, of everyday men. So uh, important that we understand that as well, came out of the Middle Ages. John, if I could add, pre-Constantine, the, the magic, if you will, actually worked against Christians as well. He had a terrible PR. People who didn't like the, the Jewish Christians, uh, they said, well, they believe in incest because they call each other brothers and sisters and mm -hmm. live together. They're probably cannibals because they talk about drinking blood, eating the uh, flesh. Mm -hmm. So they had a terrible PR program. Yes. And people said these people just can't be trusted. And it's not as much that they were excluded, they excluded themselves as well. They were kind of isolationists. Yeah, uh, it, it, at the time of Constantine, no more than 10% of the population could be described as Christian. And what you're describing is a certain resentment that Judaism, Jews, had with Christianity. The Gospel of Matthew talks about how the the, the Pharisees were responsible for the death of Jesus. Probably not the case, but what he was trying to do was portray traditional Judaism as separate from and hostile to the idea of Christianity. It, so it's in the Gospels at that time. And that misunderstanding, that animosity continued on. And by the way, the Christians were pretty good about blaming the Jews for all sorts of things, too. So it's, it's not, it was a two-way street. Yes, sir? Also, uh, Christianity spread so quickly because it was inclusive rather than exclusive, like the old Judaism. Yeah, and, and, but there were political reasons for that, too. So it, it, yes, salvation. Yes, it was a message for both the wealthy and the poor. Yeah, and that's a very powerful thing. But on the other hand, part of the expansion was political. And by the way, uh, we're going to talk about Reformation next week. The Reformation was as much a political event as it was a spiritual and religious event. So it, the intermixture of political and religious <clears throat> was certainly true at the time. And by the way, it's true today, if I might make that point. Um, there's a couple of things important to note here, and that is during the Middle Ages, a lot of what we know about the church today didn't exist. It began to in, be incorporated in, the, in uh, Christianity, in, in the Catholic Church, slowly. So, for instance, uh, one of the great challenges that bishops had was to educate the priests. They were completely dumb about Christian theology. Well, so how do you do that? And by the way, how do you make sure that they're focused on their job? Well, celibacy was an answer. Uh, we want to make sure these guys are focused on what they should be doing. No family, no marriage. Let's. And so the idea of celibacy of the priesthood began probably in the 11th or 12th century. Um, seven sacraments. Yes, the Eucharist was this magic experience, but the sacrament of marriage the, the sacrament of Holy Communion, the sacrament of becoming a priest, all these did not exist. They were instituted slowly over time. Um, the authority of the Pope, I've mentioned uh, at the start of, of the Middle Ages, the Pope was one of, one, of the, one of the bishops. Gradually, and we'll talk more about that, the Pope's authority became to be much more hierarchical, much more responsible for all bishops and all the priests in Christendom. But this idea took a while to develop. Um, we already mentioned the separation between uh, the, those who went to church and the whole religious mystic experience. It was, it, they were simply observers and uh, often dumb observers about what was going on. It didn't make any difference. But part of why people went is because the church was a sanction was a sanctuary of peace in this very troubled, very violent uh, culture called the Middle Ages. It was a place where you could go and be away from the hurly burly of life. So in some ways, it was a kind of social club as much as it was a religious experience. Important to understand. <laughs> Um, the notion of sainthood, 
Um, so in the early Christian days, martyrs were considered to be special, important people. Why? They died for the cause. They died for Jesus. And th that gave them a certain uh, sanctified reputation within uh, Christianity. Uh, this was, many people tried to replicate this by becoming hermits and going off into a cave somewhere and thinking spiritual thoughts. And they also were seen as sanctifying figures. Um, uh, these saints became revered. They became, remember this was, this was a spiritual time. Science didn't exist really at the time. So if somebody died as a martyr, or somebody was out in a cave praying, you felt that they had a certain touch with God and with Jesus that you did not. And this was an important part of identifying yourself, not just with Jesus and God, but with that hermit or with that martyr. And of course, over time, the whole idea of having a single hermit, well, why not have a group of hermits? Why not have a group of monks? Why not have monasteries? And so, and so these monasteries were groups of people devoted to prayer, devoted to uh, re religious uh, uh, focus on, uh, on the godly, on Christ, and they were different from everybody else. And to, to that extent, they had a certain emotional, psychological appeal to the population. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, these, the idea of these sanctified figures, saints, if you will, when they died, they had a physical remain. They had a cape. They had clothing. Maybe they had a ring. Maybe they had a bone. Something that was the physical remains of this very spiritual figure. And people would want to visit these places because that, that was, after all, a way to identify and connect with Christ and with God through the remains of these martyrs and saints and monks. So this whole idea of this spiritual presence of saints uh, started in the Middle Ages. We have that today. Uh, there is a process where somebody is uh, awarded sainthood. And I won't go through all the details, but it takes a long time. There has to be a lot of evidence of this, but that power remains today. And it began during this time of celebrating martyrs and hermits and monks as a part of connecting more directly with God and Jesus. Um, it also became a kind of place to go. If you knew that the relics of a particular saint in a particular area was at a, a church, you would want to visit there. Why do you want to be close to this? Well, this became a kind of economic thing. Well, geez, all these people coming to the church, there's money to be made. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be cynical about it, but the fact is that it promoted trade. It promoted travel. It promoted interconnectivity. What, what started in the Middle Ages as these little separate communities run by these individual rulers became much more broad-based, and as the wealth of the of Western Europe increased, it became much more a part of how trade and wealth and, by the way, shared experiences were generated. Now, there's a question. Please let me know. Uh, so the monasteries. Let's talk a little bit about monasteries. Uh, they were, um, we, we already mentioned this, they grew out of the whole idea of martyrs and hermits. They became communities. And there was a, 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 a religious figure called Benedict. Have you heard of Benedictine? Well, yeah. Bene Benedict put together what amounts to a rule book for how uh, uh, monasteries ought to operate. There were rules about what you did. And you spent a lot of time in prayer. 
Uh, you also had to work, of course, because people had to feed themselves. Uh, but but there were rules about exactly what you should do, how much time you should spend, what you should say. All of these were applied from monastery to monastery to monastery. Not all, not all monasteries were Benedictine, but this became pretty much a way for the monastery experience to replicate it place after place. Um, yeah, we already mentioned this. Uh, Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about the <coughs> spiritual importance of monasteries in this video. It has a tremendous influence on society outside the monastic walls, because central to our discussion is a paradox. The paradox is that while monks are trying to escape the world, the world is following them. The world is very interested in their prayers because their prayers are thought to have a powerful, real world, this world effect. So as the monks become more distant from society, God hears their prayers with more and more sympathy. Therefore, their prayers have a kind of power, a power to benefit others. This notion of power is like some kind of, uh, you know, almost electrical utility. They're building up an incredible amount of electricity, if you want to call it that, or let's say spiritual energy, to be more accurate. Way more than they need. Way more than they can consume. You know, they're, they're like some little... Uh, um, Persian Gulf state that is producing 10% of the world's oil. There's no way they can use all of that. Um, in this case, then how does the surplus get distributed? It gets distributed through the generosity of people outside the world worried about the condition of their souls. The notion that I, possessor of spiritual reserves and spiritual power, can pray for you sinful knight, sinful king, sinful merchant, is called intercession. The notion that I can intercede for you. And we've already seen this, haven't we? We've seen this with the saints in Gregory of Tours and in other texts. We try to emphasize how important the saints are, not just for our understanding of medieval religion, but for our, our understanding of medieval society. Remember that I tried to emphasize that one of the problems, once you're done with the Roman Empire, is how society is held together. In the Roman Empire, it's pretty clear. It's held together by institutions that, though not the same of our, as the own, are translatable to our own law, administrative structure, of land holding, the whole panoply of uh, what passes for civilized life. But in the early Middle Ages, after the collapse of the Roman Empire, well, we've seen the society does not have as much literacy, does not have very good records. Uh, the kings are thugs. Uh, the political order is very unstable. There's an awful lot of warfare. There's a lot of di disorder. You can't just dial 911 and expect a response. So the question then becomes what holds that society together? And we mention some things, including the church. And here we're looking at a particular instance of how that works, because the monks, far from being kind of out there in the forest or desert or some remote region, or even if they are in the forest or desert and some remote region, are extremely important to how society functions, because this is a society in which the spiritual, the military, the political, the economic are not easily conceptually separated. So uh, the bishops and the monasteries form a kind of social glue within Western Europe called Christendom. And there was a political implication to this. There was a spiritual implication to this. There was a religious implication to this. And all of these things were sort of 
crammed together into one thing, not easily separated. It's important that we understand that. Um, to some extent, we see that today where people see their religious ideas as being a very important part of what government ought to do. And uh, I'm not being critical of that so much as saying it's an old idea. It's not new and lar largely arising out of this experience and actually arising out of the Roman Empire where the whole notion of, uh, of gods and the state were one thing. You, you worshiped a Caesar, you worshiped uh, a God, it was often the same thing. So this, that idea infused itself into the Middle Ages and one we see today in various ways to be true. Um, <coughs> John? Yeah. Graphic question. Please. The, the Eastern borderlands yes. of medieval Western Europe, would that be the Danube? Would it be what's now, I don't know, the German Polish border, or <coughs> roughly where we go? Yeah. And actually, uh, Rich, I, I removed some of this, in, in, this information from this. Because I thought, well, we, we could be here until next Tuesday. I don't want to do that. But <clears throat> to, to be clear, the Eastern Empire uh, was Christian, but it became its own Christian thing. We now know it as uh, Orthodox Christianity. Uh, and unlike the Western Europe, the organization of this was much more regional and ethnic and national in its characteristic. So we see, for instance, uh, uh, Orthodox Christianity in the Balkans. You can find people in, in the Balkans that see themselves as Serbian Orthodox Christians, Russian Orthodox Christians. So from uh, the, Balk the, 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 the Serbian Greek uh, uh, portion of Western Europe to the East, this became much more of an Orthodox Christianity experience. Um, and just a brief note, uh, Eastern Orthodoxy has the same doctrines, many of the same rituals as the Catholic Church. So they believe in the Eucharist, does, as does the Western Church. They believe in a high degree of ritual, <clears throat> of costuming, um, and a, a lot of the a, a lot of the, uh, the the accoutrement, if you will, of the religious experience is shared same with Eastern Orthodox as with the Western Church. I don't know if you've ever been to, uh, but there are differences. Uh, I used to travel to Russia uh, uh, quite a bit, and I went into a Russian Orthodox church, and there are no pews. You stand. Uh, and it's a whole different, and by the way, you'd be surprised to what extent you need to pay attention when, when you're standing. It does help a little bit on focus. But so I, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think of Ukraine right now. Yes. Especially Western Ukraine. Um, not too far from here is a longstanding Ukrainian Catholic church um, right over in Bethany. Right. And yet an awful lot of, you know, the religious tension that's part of this war is about Russian orthodoxy. Yes. Meeting up with even evangelical Protestantism, which has made some inroads in Ukraine. Right. They're making life pretty difficult. It, this is further complicated because... Islam infiltrated this whole area. So you can find door to door Orthodox Christians and Muslims. Um, and uh, by the way, uh, uh, there's a whole course in this that I won't bother you with, but uh, Islam came to the party relatively late. It came in about 600 or so, 600 years after the, re the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So uh, it was late to the party. To some extent, it was built on uh, it, about presenting itself as a uh, mon as a monotheistic reform movement. 
where they had to be much more focused on God, not on Christ, not on the Holy Trinity. What is, what is the Holy Trinity anyway? Uh, what, who is this Jesus guy? It's God. He's the one that we no, need to focus on. Yeah. So uh, I won't get into the whole Islam and all that, but but mm -hmm. so this part of the of the world, uh, both in terms of Orthodox Christianity and Islam, is very complicated, mm -hmm. and it's pockmarked with communities that believe one thing or another. Unlike what we see in Western Europe, there are economic reasons why Western Europe is so consistent, and that is a part not just of the Reformation story. But in the Industrial Revolution, which helped Western Europe become dominant in world politics and in the accumulation of wealth. Any questions so far? Yes, sir. I'm going to assume that in the Eastern Orthodox Church, uh, the priests spoke the language of the people <clears throat> rather than Latin. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, <clears throat> I should say, uh, you may mention the point about Latin. Latin was the common language. It was the only language that was common to the entire Western Europe. That was not so uh, in Eastern Orthodox religion, in part because it was so local. It was so concentrated in a particular area and a particular ethnicity, uh, particularly geography, that Latin became uh, unused in a way that was not in in Western Europe. Even now, you can attend Catholic services where Latin is spoken. Why? Because people believe that somehow it's original. It's important to go back to the, 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 the beginnings of Christianity as they understand it. And part of that has to do with use of Latin in religious services. I'm about ready to leave the Middle Ages. So one last chance at a question. Uh, I'm going to start the Reformation. Uh, I won't end, end it at, by any means, but at least I'll give you some idea of what to expect. Um, and uh, I should tell you that <clears throat> unlike common understanding, where the Reformation was Martin Luther attacking the 95 Thesis on the, on the front door of a church, it was hundreds of years in its making. It was not a singular event. There were a number of very important factors that contributed to what we see as the Reformation. Um, <clears throat> and um, so the Reformation not was a result of some increased wealth. We'll talk more about that. Increased wealth, agricultural production, the uh, the climate moderated a little bit. And so it became possible to produce more and more agricultural crops. With the crops came trade, and we'll get into that next week in some detail, but the, the, the development of wealth and trade and literacy helped the Reformation. Um, it also helped the papacy. You remember all, all of these rulers giving land to bishops? Well, they did the <coughs> land of the Pope. And the Pope became very wealthy and very influential. Have you heard of the papal states? They no longer exist, but the papal states were a swath of land running uh, northeast to southwest down central uh, uh, Italy, the center of which was Rome, and these were owned by the Pope. So the rising wealth of the area also contributed to the rising wealth and power of the papacy, which is another reason why the Reformation occurred, is because the church became very powerful and somewhat abusive in its own uh, ideas of how to run the church. Um, the Crusades, we think of the Crusades as you know, this going off and, and going to Jerusalem and getting rid of those Muslims. Well, it also uncovered texts that had been translated from the Greek by the Muslims. And suddenly you found biblical texts that were different from the Vulgate. 
Vulgate, by the way, was was uh, was uh, uh, translated by Saint Jerome. It was in Latin. It was fixed. That was it. That was that was the Bible in Latin. Well, <clears throat> it turns out that as they began going into uh, the Middle East and the Crusades, they were uncovering Greek texts that were different from the Vulgate, sometimes in very important ways. So the Crusades helped develop a new idea of what it meant to be biblical. And, <clears throat> and also it began uh, to inform Western Europe that there was another world out there. And the world was not just um, trade, it was religious as well. Um, <clears throat> and Luther, by the way, did start out by saying, I'm going to develop my own religion. He, he was trying to, to, uh, to, to address the abuses of the Catholic Church, both in terms of its administrative practices, we'll talk more about that next week, but also its view of what it meant to, to be saved. What is salvation? How do you achieve it? The church saw itself as a mediator between the believer and, and God. And they were there to help everyone become saved through uh, penance, through uh, prayers, through the whole notion of purgatory. We'll talk about that next week. So, but but on the other hand, Luther said, wait a minute, we don't need the church to do this. We, we, we must have faith. We must rely on ourselves to some extent to achieve salvation, not just up to the church or God. We'll talk more about next week. But this, this whole idea of the Reformation was hundreds of years in the making. It was complicated. It was, it, Luther uh, was a clever guy, by the way, don't get me wrong, very important part of the Reformation came from Luther's efforts, but by no means was he the only reason for the Reformation occurring. Um, yes, sir. I'll say something about the Crusades. <clears throat> I think it was a defensive war, because by about the year 800, Islam already had Spain, <laughs> and they were defeated in France, by the French. That's what stopped. But the Crusades were de defensive because Islam wanted Europe. Yeah, um, and, and that's an important point. It's also interesting to note that Urban, who was the Pope at the time, one of the reasons why he started the Crusades was that he had a lot of bored, unbusy, very powerful secular chieftains. And they were sort of a threat. So what better way to get them under control by saying, there's the Middle East. Let's rally around and go and save the, the Middle East from itself. So I don't mean to be so cynical about it because it, 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 it had an impact and people were willing to, to give their lives up to the crusade. But there was a sort of another secular reason behind the crusades. Yes, Claire. A uh, question about the third bullet. Do you have any examples of what they discovered that was so different in the Greek text from what they had at the time? Because I've heard that there were some gospels written by women that were not, that didn't make the cut. Absolutely. Well, and, and yes. So a lot of what we know about the, remember in, uh, what was it, the third session, we talked about the unruly nature of the Christian church and all these gospels. Mm -hmm. Well, to some extent, these gospels were found out as they went into Jerusalem, discovered all these texts that existed that nobody knew about. So yeah, there was lots of things they discovered that in the Crusades that were not necessarily a part of the objectives of the uh, original idea, but nonetheless helped uh, the development of Christianity and also the Reformation later on. Okay, well, you know what? I, I deem it successful when I finish on time. So, so thank you very much for your time. Next week, we're going to talk about the Reformation. And I don't know when we're going to do Christianity in America. We'll have to figure that out. <laughs>